Welcome to our Wednesday evening class here at Westside Church of Christ. This, this series of <clears throat> lessons this quarter, we're following up on each Sunday morning's lesson uh, where someone speaks specifically about missions if it's not an actual missionary. And this past uh, Sunday, we had a lesson from Josh Sneed of our mission committee, but I wanna say this before we get into the lesson. This is the last Wednesday where I'll be speaking, I think, to an empty auditorium. Next Wednesday, I hope you'll all be here, and I'm looking forward to that. And we'll have our regular Wednesday evening services with singing, uh, prayers. Uh, we'll have uh, a lesson based, again, on the previous Sunday's lesson uh, from the Book of Acts. And, and I hope this, this, uh, you're all looking forward to getting back together. I'm really looking forward to it. And I, I really hope to have an active class rather than just lecture uh, like I have been to an empty auditorium. But I have a class that will raise a hand and ask a question and, and try to stump the speaker. And, and I, I'll be the first to admit that you'll probably be able to stump me, but I'll find you an answer. If not that night, I'll get you one before the next lesson. So let's go into tonight's lesson. Uh, Sunday, Josh Sneed from our missions committee had an excellent lesson for us on some of the things that the missions committee has to do uh, in, in working with our missions and the questions that they have to consider. The first question he put up there is how do we, as American churches, handle missions money? And, and that's a very, very important question because the church does have limited resources. The Lord has no limits, but our church and every church individually has a in, uh, limitation. So we've got to be wise stewards of that money and how do we handle that as a church? The second question he had up there is how do we encourage missionaries toward the goal of working themselves out of a job? Because ideally, uh, once they get a church established, a uh, church uh, going forward with an eldership, with deacons and get their own preacher, uh, that missionary can go on and establish another church if that's, that's his uh, vocation. Uh, another question that Josh had for us is how do we share the burden of fulfilling the Great Commission with our missionaries? And this is an important thing that all of us have to consider because we are to consider and share each other's burdens. And our missionaries and their families uh, absolutely need us to share that with them. Before we get into any of these topics, I want to just say something about the missions committee. And this applies to missions committees of every church I've ever been to or been a part of. I'll start by saying this, in, in 1803, Thomas Jefferson had completed the purchase of what's called the Louisiana Territory. Some people call that the Louisiana Purchase for about $15 million or less than three cents an acre, which is a pretty remarkable thing. And he was determined that an exploration be made of that new territory and try to discover a passage to the Pacific Ocean. He wrote a letter to Congress asking them to authorize the funds to start that expedition. And he said in that letter, that the leader of that expedition has to be a man of undaunted courage. I have to say that anyone who serves on the commission, missions committee, any member of the church who serves on the commissions committee has to be a person of undaunted courage because these folks are under tremendous pressure. Uh, it's not just from the missionaries that we support, but literally daily, if uh, not daily, certainly weekly, uh, they get letters and, and appeals for funds from missions and missionaries uh, that we don't know, never have heard of, and, and they're always sending uh, inviting, appealing letters that, that sound great, and, and the missions committee, knowing that they have limited funds, literally has to uh, look at these and, and, and see if they're justified in, the, in our church support. So they have to go through this continuously. And in addition to that, with our regular missionaries that, that we support, they stay in constant contact with them. They get phone calls, they get text messages, they get emails, uh, they get letters, they write letters. And, and this is an ongoing, continuing thing. And, and often uh, they travel to the most remote parts of the world to visit with these missionaries in person to encourage them about the work that they're doing and help them 
uh, find out what's going on so we can help them some more. They have to be men who are fully and wholly committed to fulfilling the Great Commission. And that, that's why I say, as a general rule, I believe these men are just like Meriwether Lewis, William Clark, men of undaunted courage from what they have to do to uh, fulfill the Great Commission through the local church. Let's look at what Acts may tell us based on Josh's lesson that we can learn from, from uh, what Dr. Luke had to say to us through the book of Acts. The first question is how did the church in Acts handle missions money? Well, you have to go to Acts chapter 13 to see the original missions committee, that, that first committee of uh, men of undaunted courage. Uh, we read that there was a church in Antioch that had uh, men by the name of Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, he was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and there was Saul. They met together, and we know what happened as a result of their meeting and how the Holy Spirit moved them. We know that Barnabas, when we first meet him in Acts chapter 4, he, his real name was Joseph, but he was called Barnabas by the apostles because that means son of encouragement. And that's exactly what he did throughout his whole uh, life as, as an apostle mission, missionary. He's called an apostle with a little a in the book of Acts. Uh, but that's what he did. He was a Levite. He was a Jew, of course, a Levite. And he was from Cyprus. We'll follow up on that in a little bit later. Simeon, it says, who is also called Niger, that's a Latin word that means that Simeon was very dark or black. This tells us that the church at Antioch not only was a Gentile church, but it was a, a church made up of different, different ethnicities. Uh, and that's, that's a remarkable thing, showing that this first missions committee was made up of, of different people with different backgrounds, Gentiles and Jews. And, and so it's, it's a great thing to see as an example. There was a man called Lucius, of, uh, it says he was of Cyrene. Uh, Lucius was probably a Jew from North Africa. It's near the modern day Tripoli is where Cyrene would be. We'll show it on a map here in a little bit. But uh, Cyrene was very, very important in the, in the scriptures, in the development of the early church. If, if you recall from Matthew chapter 27, verse 32, as Jesus was carrying that cross, trying to carry that cross on the way to Calvary, it says along the way they found a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross of Jesus. So Simon from Cyrene was very important. Uh, some, some consider Cyrene as, uh, Simon as possibly one of the men who initially carried the gospel message to Antioch. But uh, among the founders of the church at Antioch were these men from Cyrene. I just wanted to mention this a little bit earlier. Uh, and let me go on to the slide I want to get to. That's not it. I'll back up a little bit. Uh, among the founders of the church were men from, from Cyrene. If we look in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, after the persecution of, Jesus, of, of uh, Stephen, it says some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. I want to try to go forward right quick to see that slide that I prepared for Cyrene. There it is. That's the Mediterranean Ocean. Uh, if you see just to the uh, left third of that is Cyrene. That's near what is called the modern city of Tripoli. Notice if you go straight east, there's Jerusalem, and in the very far upper right-hand corner of this slide would be Antioch of Syria. Now, this Antioch is extremely important in the development of the church in the first century. There were four major cities in the Roman Empire along the Mediterranean. Of course, Rome was number one, a city of approximately a million and a half people at that time. Alexandria in Egypt, was number two. The third city of the entire Roman Empire was Antioch of Syria, which some believe at that time had a population close to 400,000 people. And the fourth city was Byzantium, which later became Constantinople, which is today Istanbul. Uh, 
So Antioch was a significantly large city back in those. The church was founded there by these men from Cyrene, where it says in Acts chapter 11, 19 through 20, that some of them from this persecution after Stephen's death, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Your Bible may say that they were, they were speaking to the Hellenists, uh, but a better translation of that is that they were actually speaking to Greeks because Hellenists can, could be confusing and you'd think that they were speaking to Jews who spoke, spoke Greek. But the context here tells us that they were actually speaking to Greeks. After Peter had taken the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts 10, these men continued to take the gospel to the Gentiles in Antioch. Some speculate, like I mentioned a while ago, that Simon of Cyrene from Matthew chapter 27 may have been one of these men from Cyrene who went to Antioch, but we don't have any, any proof of that through the scriptures. But note that uh, from Cyrene, way out there in the, it'd actually be in the middle of the Mediterranean, but it's, it's west, way west of Jerusalem. They were actually present on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, if you wanna go back and read Acts chapter two, verses seven through 11. So Cyrene was very, very important in the early days of the church. There was a man there by, by the name of Manaean, and your translations may either call him a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, uh, others may call him a foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch. He could have been one of Luke's direct sources. Uh, we read back in Luke chapter one, verse two, when he said that those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and minister the, ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So Luke, of course, was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he certainly got a lot of information from actual eyewitnesses, and one of them may well have been Manan. And then, of course, it mentions that Saul was there. We know that Saul was there. He was brought to Tarsus by Barnabas. Uh, he had uh, recently returned with Barnabas uh, from taking relief from the church in Antioch to the church in Jerusalem. We read about that in Acts chapter 12, verse 25. Uh, they sent the relief uh, from the church in Antioch, and that's in Acts chapter 11, verse 30. These responsible men, guided by the Holy Spirit, set apart Barnabas and Saul and sent them off. So literally by the act of sending them off, it clearly implies that the church at Antioch provided Barnabas and Saul with the means to travel throughout their missionary journey. You know, I've traveled all over the world, both in military and business. And in recent years, I've, I've made many, many trips to, uh, to Japan, for instance, uh, to Europe. Uh, and I never travel with more than $200 cash. I mean, today you can go anywhere in the world on credit cards. These men didn't have credit cards. They didn't have traveler's checks. Uh, they didn't have credit probably of, that we would think of, they had to have the means to support themselves. And we see the church at Antioch using their missions committee money wisely by funding these men and sending them off on their missionary journey. Recall that Josh made the point about the church being careful with the money and having to be used wisely. And Acts shows us exactly how wisely Barnabas and Saul used their money from Antioch in their very first missionary journey. The first thing they did was they went to Cyprus. Now that's a map uh, that shows the island of Cyprus and you can see that it's in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's, it's kind of a funny shaped island. It's got a point on it going toward the Northeast. Today it's, uh, it's not a happy place. Uh, the Turks claim they own half of it. The Greeks own, claim they own half of it. Uh, I used to fly through there all the time. You see that point up there that extends to the northeast. We had to be very, very careful about not flying over that point as we were flying north toward the, you see the town up there in Turkey called Adana because that would have been flying over what Turkey claimed was their territory and they would have been real unhappy with that without having permission to do that. Uh, I happened to be in Adana, by the way, in 1974 woke up that morning, went to the airport. Our flight plan was to go to Athens that day. <laughs> and lo and behold, in the middle of the night, Turkey had gone to war with Greece. So having a flight plan to fly from Madonna to Athens was not gonna happen. 
In fact, we weren't going to take off because they had about 150 fighter planes lined up to go bomb the Turks on Cyprus. I'm, bomb, I'm sorry, bomb the Greeks on Cyprus, which they did, and we had to sit there. It took about an hour for them to fly down there, drop their bombs, and come back. And we watched them come back and do their barrel rolls. They were real happy guys, make their landings. And then we departed, and we uh, had refiled our flight plan to go to Rome. But you can see we got somewhere out there in the Mediterranean, and we refiled and went to Athens after all. But uh, Cyprus has been an unhappy place for a long, long time. But Paul, or Saul, he's called, and Barnabas wisely chose Cyprus as the first place they would go for their mission. They went to Cyprus because, remember, where's Barnabas from? Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, a Levite from Cyprus. Barnabas, he was a native of Cyprus. And they went there, they arrived at Salamis, and they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Now, note that the gospel had already been taken there. Saul and Barnabas were not the first Christian missionaries to come to Cyprus. And in Acts chapter 11, going back to verse 19, it says, those who were scattered because of the persecution that rose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. So Barnabas and Saul were wise stewards of the mission's money from Antioch because they didn't try to duplicate the work that was already being done. It's not recorded in the book of Acts that they went and visited churches in Cyprus. It says they went and proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. So it's important that they use that money wisely, and they did so. Today's world, we have to be very, very careful about being wise and mindful of the Lord's money and, and how we support our missionaries. Uh, give an example. I, I don't want you to try to read the fine print on this graph because it's almost impossible to read. I just want you to see the variances, the highs and the lows. What this is, is something you can pull up any day on the internet. It just happens to be the currency exchange rate between the US dollar and the Euro. Now, we support missionaries in Thailand and their currency is called the Bahat. We support missionaries in Zambia, their, their currency is called the Kawacha. We support missionaries in South Africa and their currency is called the Rand. And every day on the world exchange markets, you can see the fluctuations in the value of that currency versus the US dollar. I, I, get, I got a letter, for instance, uh, last week from a missionary in Slovakia that was concerned because his funds had literally been cut by 10% because of the currency exchange rate. The churches were still sending exactly the same dollars that they had committed to when they made up their missions budget at the end of every year. And they were sending him monthly checks for those exact same dollars. But the US dollar is weak and falling in rate uh, comparison to the Euro. And so he just literally had a 10% pay cut because of that. A lot of reasons for currency fluctuations and politics has a lot to do with it. but. Missionaries have to live with that every day of their life. And the missions committee, those men with undaunted courage, have to understand that and have to do their best to encourage the missionaries and, and do what they can to make sure that they're not suffering because of these exchange rate cuts. Wisely, just like the church at Antioch sending Barnabas and Saul, we also use local missionaries whenever possible. Men who relate to the local community and the language and customs. Josh used the example of Udorn uh, as showing an example of how effective a native speaker can be. He talked about how many churches he's established and all the work he's done over the years and it's just tremendous. And Udorn told us himself the week before in his message to us that he had formerly been a Buddhist and he understood the beliefs and the culture of the people to whom he preaches and, and that's the wonderful thing about having a native, a local native speak to the people uh, and it's a wise thing to do that uh, and because of that he's continued to establish churches, he continues fulfilling the work of the Great Commission in Thailand. Another example about how effective a 
local native could be. And I want to show you this picture. I, I just pulled this up from this week's Christian Chronicle. This gentleman, his name is Isaac Adoti. If you don't know about Isaac Adoti, he established 1,000 churches of Christ in Ghana. It's estimated that he baptized 50,000 people in Ghana. He's famous for his reply to the question when somebody said, Isaac, how are you today? His reply was better than yesterday. What's more, I'm one day closer to heaven. Well, that day came last month. Isaac Adoti passed away at age 63 on August the 13th. But you can see how effective it was to have a local missionary in a place like Ghana who could establish a thousand churches and baptize 50,000 uh, taking the gospel in, real, in a relatively short time at a young age of 63 passing away at age 63. So the next question that we want to look at is how did the early missionaries of the church take the gospel to the Gentile world. Let's go back again and look at uh, Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. Talking again about the scattering after the persecution, it says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, Luke wrote under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when he wrote these things, it wasn't an accident. I want you to notice the subtle change in the way he changes his phraseology from Verse 17, when we see Peter telling the church at Jerusalem about the conversion of Cornelius, and Peter uses the phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Messiah. And now in verse 20, we see men from Cyprus and Cyrene taking the gospel message to Greeks, and Luke used the phrase, the Lord Jesus these Greek Gentiles in Antioch would have had no knowledge of a promised Messiah or a Christ. It would have been a waste of their time to sit there and talk to them about the promise of the Messiah because they had no knowledge of that. But they knew that they could be taught that there was a Lord Jesus, a Lord of Lords, a King of Kings, and that was who they should submit to. And that was the gospel that they were taking, uh, that was being taken to them. And, and so by that subtle, simple change, we see these men becoming more effective and you can see the result. It states there, a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So we have to have missionaries that understand and appreciate the people that they're speaking to and taking the gospel to and understand how to do that. The lesson for us is to Make sure our missionaries are speaking the language of the people we are trying to reach, taking the good news of Jesus to them in a way they can understand. And that's kind of difficult to do in some respects. Take, for instance, Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. People quickly detect differences in language. Look what it says there. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language and they were amazed and astonished saying are not all these who are speaking Galileans now I want you to focus on that phrase these who are speaking are Galileans they were speaking in 15 different languages but they still had their own dialect, their own accents, and the people could detect that they were Galileans. Uh, give me an example, I've, I've traveled to Montreal, France. Uh, 
got yelled at by a waiter because I asked for a menu in English, and they don't appreciate that in Montreal, France. <laughs> but I've also traveled to Paris, France. And when I ask a Parisian about someone in Montreal who speaks French, they just laugh and say they just think they speak French. Uh, another example, I, my wife is from New Jersey. And she's from southern New Jersey. She doesn't have the accent that she'd think you would, she would have if she was from northern New Jersey. But we were living in West Texas many years ago, and, and I advertised a, a Pontiac for sale. And when I got home, she told me that someone had called about that car. And, of course, she likes to mimic people when they talk, call. And she said, that man called asking about the Pontiac, <laughs> because that's the way he pronounced it. And she said, yes, my husband has the Pontiac for sale. And, and the man said, no, wait a minute. You sound like a foreigner. And I don't want to buy a car from a foreigner. <laughs> and she said, well, I'm from New Jersey, but my husband's from West Texas. And he said, OK, I'll talk to him. So I called him, found out that he was a collector of Pontiacs, a very wealthy man. This was one he didn't have in his collection. So he bought it. Uh, but he could detect that my wife was not a native. I've got another good friend by the name of Joe uh, that is a very unusual person. Joe graduated from Merchant High School near San Angelo, and that's a, the limit of his formal education. But Joe is what's called an autodidactic. He's self-educated. Joe literally reads a book every day, and he doesn't read novels. He reads technical books. He reads philosophy. He reads some serious literature. He's considered a world authority on Julius Caesar, He's read every book in the English language published on Julius Caesar. And when he ran out of that and found out there were other books in Latin, he taught himself Latin so he could read those books about Julius Caesar. But Joe's lived in Venezuela for many, many years. He's completely fluent in Spanish. His son's a sophomore at Texas A&M this year. And if you talk to his son and say, how's your dad's Spanish? His son will just laugh because his son grew up in Venezuela and speaks fluent Spanish. He said, my dad speaks Spanish with the most horrible Texas accent you've ever heard. And that's the way Joe speaks. By the way, if you don't know the term autodidactic, uh, there's some very famous people that were autodidactic. A gentleman by the name of Granville Woods, he's called the Black Thomas Edison that holds scores and scores of patents. He's self-educated. Mark Twain was autodidactic. Former President Harry Truman was autodidactic. So these kinds of things lend it to tell us that people can detect our accents and that early church was wise in how they went about uh, accounting for that because you'll note that early in his ministry Paul recruited Timothy. Timothy was part Jewish, he was part Gentile, but he was from Lystra. He spoke the local dialect. so when Paul and Timothy went into an area to speak to the natives, Timothy could speak and sound like one of the local people and, and, and people would, would appreciate that more. Uh, it's Paul Josh spoke of the need for missionaries to work themselves out of a job. And, and this is so important. I'm going to get to that uh, slide. We can't have missionaries <clears throat> who just don't perform and don't succeed and just continue to ask the church for money. They've literally got to work themselves out of a job. I mentioned that missionary last week from Houghton, Houghton uh, Michigan, that had been in that city of Houghton and been a missionary for over 20 years and had three converts. Now, at some point in time, some missions committee might have had to look at that and say, is this the best use of the Lord's money? <clears throat> I mentioned to you that this, these uh, people in that area have a very, very dominating denomination that they've, they've been a part of for 400 years going back to their native Norway. <clears throat> and in my position, when I lived in Michigan, I had to hire some engineers and I, I had to interview one of those young men from Michigan Tech, had a great resume, mechanical engineer, just excellent grades. But I was put off by the very first line on his resume after his name and address. <clears throat> 
The very first name on his resume was of pure Norwegian extraction. <laughs> I've read a lot of resumes. I have never, ever seen anything like that. So I went through the, uh, HR had requested me to interview the young man, so I went through the process of interviewing him, but I shuttled him out of my office as quickly as possible because there was no way this young man was going to get a job in my organization. So what does the book of Acts tell us about how early church missionaries did that to work themselves out of a job? In Acts chapter 11, verses 26 and 25, we see Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And it said, when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now, this is the key phrase for what, focusing on what they did to work themselves out of a job. It says, for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And the last verse in that uh, phrase, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So we see that they met with the church, they strengthened the church to the point that they had this very first missions committee that we started the lesson about. They taught for a full year in Antioch. And it was, the church grew to the point that it was strong enough that when they heard through a prophet that there was gonna be a famine in Judea, this mission church, if you wanna call it that, sent relief via Barnabas and Saul in Acts chapter 11, verse 29, it says, so the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So that's amazing that Barnabas and Saul were able to strengthen this church to the point where they were needed uh, as, as uh, much as, as the church itself could handle this kind of business. The church was strengthened to the point that it could send out its own missionaries. We talked about that from this first missionary committee, committee Barnabas and Saul. It's, it's kind of striking if you read some of the things that's happening in the religious world today. It's kind of striking that 150, 200 years ago or even further, the great work of the denominational world was to send missionaries to Africa. And we can read about some of those men and and the work that they did and, and uh, the churches that supported them. But those churches to not today, those denominational, denominational churches have really departed even further away from the scriptures than they were 200 years ago. And it's an interesting thing what's happening in Africa today. Churches in Africa, and I'm talking about denominational churches in Africa, are in a large part fairly conservative. And they're sending missionaries back to the UK and back to the USA to try to straighten out the denominations that have originally supported them because they have departed so far from the word. And it's, a, it's amazing when you read about those kind of things in, in uh, Pew Research and other places and see what's happening in reverse to those denominations. In Acts chapter 15, verse 36, we read here where it says sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And in verse 36, it says he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And the result in chapter 16, verse five, it so it says, so the churches were strengthened in faith and grew in numbers. So here again, we see missionaries working themselves out of a job. But they worked themselves out of a job because they were committed to stay. They did, just didn't come in, preach a gospel sermon and leave, or come in for a week and have a gospel meeting and, and leave. We see Paul stayed in Corinth for 18 months. In Acts chapter 18, verse 11, it says, and he stayed for a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Wouldn't it have been great to go to those Wednesday night Bible studies when the apostle Paul was preaching for 18 months uh, in Corinth. Paul preached and taught at Ephesus for over three years. He said in Acts chapter 19, 31, for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. What great lessons he must have been able to teach over the course of those three years. I want you to contrast that to some of the things that go on today, and, and I don't want to 
I, I don't want to name any names, but I have a good friend, a good preacher friend, outstanding preacher, uh, but he's had a personal mission, and this is what he's done every other year for 20 years, is go to Slovakia. And he goes there and he spends two weeks, and he hands out tracts, he invites people to buy Bible studies. There is, by the way, a native Slovakian preacher there that he works with. He's done this for 20 years, but he never, ever learned the language. And he, and he told me one time, he said, he was handing out tracts near the university. And a lady stopped him and in broken English, all she could say was, tell me more, tell me more. And he couldn't tell her anything. In those 20 years of travels, he had not learned the language. He did not know the language at all. But contrast that with another young man that uh, I know well who graduated from Harding. He's a tremendous speaker. He's gifted in languages. He graduated from Harding with native fluency in Spanish. But he went to Slovakia and fell in love with the people in the place and he moved his wife there, lives there now, raising their family now, their children there now, learning the language. He and his wife have both learned Slovakian. They're both fluent in that language and he preaches and teaches in the local Slovak language and the church is growing. And that's the bottom line. The church is growing because of that. Another question we want to look at is how did the church in Acts encourage new churches to stay true to the scriptures? Jotja emphasized the need for missionaries to work themselves out of a job by making sure the churches were staying true to the scriptures. And obviously that's something that every missionary should be doing and continuing to do. And in Acts we see how the early church did that. The council, they had a council in Jerusalem, and this was, as you recall, to discuss it, this was being done at those who uh, were trying to force the Gentiles to be circumcised, and the council decided that was not the gospel, that was not Jesus' plan, and they sent a letter to the churches about that. And in, Act, in Acts chapter 15, verse 27, the church in Jerusalem sent a letter and said, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. So Judas and Silas were dispatched from Jerusalem to deliver this letter, but they didn't just deliver the letter like a postman and go on to the next town. He goes on to say they worked themselves out of a job, basically, because they were themselves prophets, meaning they were preachers. They encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time there, they went off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. So here they were making sure that this new church, young church in Antioch was staying close to the scriptures. They were prophets. They were sent by the church in Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas, also wanted to make sure that the churches that they established and followed up with were staying true to the scriptures. In Acts chapter 14, verses 21 and 22, we see when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. And then focused on this phrase, encouraging them, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So they encouraged them to continue in the faith, in God's word, in the scriptures. And, and that's what we want every mission church to do. Josh spoke to us about sharing the burden with the missionaries. And, and this, is a, this is so essential. It's something that we just have to do as a local church to share the burdens with those who are far because they're human beings just like us. They, they have sicknesses, illnesses. They have deaths in the family. They have struggles. They, they have a lot of burdens. And they need to know that this church is behind them, that we can share that burden with them. 
And we see some, some of this reflected in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 14, there was a horrible incident where Paul was literally dragged out and stoned and left for dead. And it says in verses 19 and 20, it says, Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But what did the local church did, do? They, there was obviously a threat there. There's obviously a crowd that's, that's willing to murder someone. But it said, when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas and Derby. So we see that local church sharing Paul's burden with him. In spite of the threats from the crowds, they gathered about him and he rose up and entered the city and so on went on with his missions. So we see the local church sharing that burden, but here's another interesting example. When Paul was on that last trip that would take him finally down to Jerusalem where he would be arrested, we see the local church at Caesarea sharing Paul's burden with him and urging him not to go to Jerusalem. I want to uh, just back up here just a second because we talked about this in the very first lesson, but we talked about how we know Luke is the author of the book of Acts as well as the gospel of Luke. One of the proofs of that is because we see the language change in Acts chapter 16 when they have the Macedonian call and immediately the language changes from they to we. Now, in this part of Acts, I'm going to read Acts chapter 21, 7 through 14, and you'll see that word we several times, but I want you to take special note of the context and how it changes again. So, so follow along with me. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. And on the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. So Luke is talking about himself and Paul and those who were traveling with him. And we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, notice how the context changes beginning in verse 12. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. And since he would not be persuaded, we seized and said, let the will of the Lord be done. So you notice how the context changes. Initially in that text, Luke is including Paul in the we. When he gets down to verse 12, he's talking about those who were traveling with him and the local church urging Paul, bearing his burden, weeping, breaking his heart, praying with him, urging him not to go on to Jerusalem, and yet he would continue on, and we know what happened when he finally did get to Jerusalem and he finally got captured. Next Sunday, we're going to have a special lesson Sunday morning from Furman Carpenter. And we've been talking about missionaries all over the world, but now Furman's going to bring it home. And he's going to be talking about parents teaching evangelism in the home. And I'm really looking forward to that lesson, you know, being uh, someone who's raising a granddaughter and she's living in our home and she's a lovely young girl. And I know so many of you have children at home. Uh, and, and this will be an extremely important lesson for all of us. So let's close with a word of prayer. Our Lord and God and Father in heaven, thank you so much again for the words of Dr. Luke. 
the words that we read that he wrote in, in the book of Acts, inspired by the Holy Spirit to tell us about how the local church interacted with the missionaries, the apostles that, that traveled around to establish the churches to preach the gospel, to proclaim, to fulfill the great commission. We thank you for that guidance and we pray, Lord, that we can take these lessons about how the local church used their money, about how they encouraged the local church, about how they encouraged the missionaries to work themselves out of a job and how they carried the burden of their missionaries. Take it to heart and we pray that all of us will do a greater job of supporting our missionaries and, and our missions committee, those of undaunted courage and all the tremendous work that they do. We pray that they continue to be in the regular prayers of every member of the church. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for his love. Thank you for the promised hope of salvation. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.